Vogue and Condé Nast. Condé Nast and Vogue, Vogue and Condé Nast. So there's been interesting things going on at the moment, right? Mostly spurred by the events that happen at Con, well, mostly spurred by the events that happen at Bon Appetit, as you've been uh, probably aware if you've been keeping up with the news. Bon Appetit have been have gone through a little bit of drama over the last couple of days. Um, I guess the news kind of well, it kind of all started because somebody leaked an image of Adam Rappaport, who is sort of like the head editor in chief of Bon Appetit, and also the person responsible, I guess, for pushing them towards um, digital video sort of stuff away from the magazine. And then that's become one of the biggest cash cows within the Condé Nast empire. Bon Appetit is owned by Condé Nast, one of um, bon Condé Nast's. Um, bits of media that they own out there he does a really good thing he pushes the video there i watch a lot of the bon appetit videos it's you know they can be a bit cringe some of the personalities are you know incredibly up themselves but once you get past all the hipster um you know fronting and shoving and showing off and shit it is pretty good show you know they they have some pretty good recipes i uh, like the personalities um the videos are produced really well bloody blah 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 a, vi a clip comes a clip is leaked <coughs> a clip is leaked by a disgruntled employee showing adam rapaport dressed up in brown face i guess he kind of him and his girlfriend at the time who also happens to be his wife now i assume um i wonder how that relationship is surviving bloody hell um they have, they wanted to dress up as latinos or whatever it may be back in the day as a halloween get up and of course um by these by today's standards it's not it's not acceptable that picture goes around it prompts her an apology which then prompts a meeting which then prompts Adam Rappaport um resigning from his position that looks like that's the base of the story right but that's not it obviously there's more layers to the story which I'll talk about later but that was sort of like the first thing the first chink in the armor and the Condé Nest kind of armor that sort of made people ask questions as to why there is an apparent lack of diversity when it comes to Condé Nast and all things you know all things Vogue um, anecdotal evidence on my side would be we have this place in the centre of London called Vogue House right where essentially Vogue is located and I've been there a couple of times I've also known people that have worked there and I've also just been around there you know um, I don't know cycling hanging around doing whatever I do and I remember specifically this one occasion where I happened to come where I happened to be around Vogue House when they had a fire alarm or a fire drill and I remember seeing like hordes of white girls come out. First of all, I was like, oh shit, there's a whole lot of hot girls I work there. But then I remember being on my bike, just sitting there watching everyone come out of the office, thinking to myself, wow, there's a lot of white people work at Vogue, innit? Like, it's just, it was just like, an, and again, I'm not that person to be like, you know, wanting to see quotas or, you know, equal gender distribution, in, equal gender representation seen in all companies. I don't think that's something to, uh, that's you can aim for right i think people should be rewarded for the skills that they for the things that they can bring to the company or for the experience and skills and not you know, based on what's in between their legs once you get into that area it just becomes a bit crazy so i'm not even a fan of that sort of um ideology but it just was just from an observing point of view just you know because i've got eyes it was just really funny to see that oh it's interesting that a magazine that purports to be the voice of fashion right that happens to be in one of the most multicultural cities in the world um happens to have uh, an employee roster of it's mostly made up of white girls and it's not even like they're only just white they're the same kind of white person right uh, fairly affluent middle class you know university graduate university educated level people like this a particular look about them right the kind of girls that wear those really colorful uh, platform heels that they sell in top shop and maybe a designer bag or jacket and shit um you know they kind of have that you know it's either boho look they hadn't have that kind of what's that alexa chung look or something like there's a particular look of those girls that work in vogue house they're very you know they're very cookie cutter so i was like oh interesting but i kept that as and those evidence but I'm also aware that fashion is weird like that, whereas, you know, it's one of those um, it's one of those places where nepotism is ripe, right? So in some cases, I wouldn't be quick to label it a racist industry. I'd say it's probably, you know, uh, it's probably fraught with nepotism more so than it is with racism, right? Where people are more likely to get their friends a job who does who who don't have any experience working in the industry as opposed to bringing in people who are underrepresented or people who are kind of on the margins they'd much rather bring their friend in i know from just you know anecdotal evidence that i've seen loads of girls that i've known in the scene 
especially in the fashion world who have kind of got their start working in fashion just from being a door girl somewhere right some one of their friends owns a fashion store or works for a particular fashion brand they want someone cool and hot to do the door to do the guest list when there's an event so they get their friend to go do it they, she does it she has no interest in fashion whatsoever and then through just standing there and looking pretty you get put in position where you might be end up being you know an editorial assistant or you might end up just being a runner in the studio somewhere for a show room that then leads you to give your foot in the industry which then leads to other things so i know that's a real big issue um but i also know just from just the kind of optic standard point of view it probably is beneficial for a company like for a magazine like vogue especially nowadays with the magazine sales dwindling to have some level of representation so that they can hit different markets just so they can stay afloat just from a purely business point of view it makes more sense so based off the back of the Condé Nast drama involving Buen Appetit, people started asking questions about what Anna Wintour was doing. And I guess this came about via some quotes attributed to Naomi Campbell about how she was treated during her time at Vogue under the stewardship of Anna Wintour. The fact that Anna Wintour you know, is getting a bit old and long in the teeth and maybe there needs to be a bit of a change and she's not very receptive to kind of I guess stepping aside, which is unfair. I think asking anyone to step aside in an industry like fashion, which is quintessentially, you know, I guess working in fashion and music, are, if you're a creative, they're probably two of the most, um, uh, would you, would not suppose, they're probably two of the most coveted positions that you want to work in, right? There is the quintessential dream job no one working in those roles would um, willingly give up their position because no one getting a job in fashion or in music is comp really hard right the odds are really stacked against you so once you do get your way in once you do get a position in there regardless if you get it via nepotism or you get it just based on your talent you're not going to be quick to um pass it along or pass it down to somebody else coming up you're gonna you know you're gonna want to basically die on the showroom floor which is you know your prerogative you can do as you please um but i think the lack of even having a conversation regarding the changing of guard is probably the most concerning part so this um, article from new york times essentially details what's actually happening at Condé Nast and what the future holds for anna winter um, and it has some very interesting troubling bits as well which kind of make me think um, there's going to be some changes sooner rather than later in that um, building regardless so this is the following this is from um, New York Times it says a reckoning at Condé Nast uh, it's written by Edmund Lee it says the following it, says, it was supposed to be Condé Nast's year the publisher of Vogue Vanity Fair and the New Yorker was going to be profitable again after years of layoffs and losses then advertising revenue suddenly dropped as the coronavirus pandemic created the economy more recently as protests against racism and police violence grew into the worldwide momentum company employees publicly complained about racism at the workplace and some in Condé in less content in response the two leaders of the nearly all white executive team the artistic director Anna Wintour and the chief executive Roger Lynch offered apologies to the staff at an all-hands um, online meeting on Friday, employees asked Miss Winter, the top editor of Vogue since 1988. God almighty. She, she's holding on to that, tight in it, not letting that one go. And the company's editorial leader since 2013 would be leaving. Mr. Lynch, the communications chief, Daniel Carrick, shot down the question, saying Miss Winter was not going anywhere and said three people who attended the meeting but were not authorised to discuss it publicly. There she is in a trademark bob and massive glasses uh tormut has tormut has hit Condé Nast, a company built partly on selling a glossy brand of elitism to the masses at a time when its financial outlook is grim last year the u.s division lost approximately 100 million dollars on about 900 million in revenue said several people with knowledge of the company who were not authorized to speak publicly the european arm has also had losses Mr. Lynch said in an interview on Friday that he was not familiar with the cited figure, citing the company's merger of its domestic intestinal operations. Part of recent restructuring had been costly. Of course, he's not familiar with it. And if there's one thing you can count on um, in the fashion industry, is rumors and leaks of information. Uh, people love to gossip in fashion, people love to share information. So if this is out there, it's definitely, there's definitely some truth to it. It continues, it says in April, the company institu uh, instituted pay cuts for anyone making over 100,000 and then came layoffs. 100 jobs are gone out of roughly 6,000, which is pretty good considering magazines are dead, right? That they were able to, they only had to let go of, you know, 100 people, right? That's less than what, less than 10%, right? That's amazing. 
no, it's not less than ten percent. Yeah, it is less than ten percent. It is right. Um, that's really good. Um, the fact that they institute pay cuts for anyone making a hundred grand is neither here nor there. I don't think there's probably there's not many people in that company that are making a hundred grand. I think that really do the work. Um. Maybe it's mostly just the executive branch, I'd assume. It continues here. It says, Condé Nast is one of the main many media organizations, including the New York Times, whose employees have questioned companies' leaders as people around the world have taken part in protests prompting by the killing of George Floyd, a black man who died last month in Minneapolis after a white police officer pinned him to the ground with his knee. With my head. This, this is the most concerning part for me. All these bits of change, all these bits of, you know, the change that's been brought about in various industries has solely come off the back of some random guy in Minneapolis dying at the hands of police officers. Like it's both distressing and also um, it fills you with some kind of hope for humanity, right? The fact that seeing this guy's life get snuffed out in front of you has essentially made people question their position, question their privilege, uh, question the lack of representation in the industry that they work in. Is really encouraging but it's also quite upsetting to think that it had to take this right it, it wasn't enough for people's accounts it wasn't enough for people's stories to be shared and all that stuff and complaints to be raised by hr that wasn't enough it had to take some guy dying you know thousands of miles away from where you live for people to suddenly start looking at themselves in the mirror and thinking what am i doing to change things for the better you know it's really really troubling um, it continues, says the company has been led by the Newhouse family since 1959. Stephen Newhouse has the parent company, Advance, and his cousin, Jonathan Newhouse, is the chairman of Condé Nast Board. Advance also controls more than 40 newspapers and news sites across the country. Many of them, including a plain dealer of Cleveland and the Star Ledger of New York, have struggled. The Newhouse family have protected itself against lots of significant investments in the cable giant charter and immediate conglomerate discovery. That could probably be a conversation for another day because I guess everyone's so busy waiting, you know, trying to get reparations through jobs. But that's a real conversation, right? If you want to, if we want to have uh, black people, if we want to have some level of political and economic power, we have to educate the younger kids coming up or even people in position now to invest in, you know, I don't know, to invest in stuff like this, right? To have a position where you are, you have a quasi monopoly on a certain industry that gives you the, the basically the leverage to do as you please with your company um i'm pretty sure that new house family if they have a daughter or a son who wants to intern at vogue or intern at vanity fair or the new yorker for sure they can get them in straight away and that's what we need more so in a black culture as opposed to just having a black chief executive or a black uh, creative director we need somebody that's actually pulling the strings behind the scenes advocating for you know people from you know minority communities and giving them a voice that's the most important thing and that really starts from the business people putting their money where their money where their mouth is and actually buying up these media companies in order to represent said culture in them that's probably the most important thing you know it's all well and good having a job and having a great nice title and you know a bit of nice bit of cardboard in your back pocket in terms of a business card but the real influence the real power comes from operating in the background pulling the strings and being part of these big media conglomerates at the new house family it continues here it says before the internet took readers away from print Condé Nast was known for its thick magazines edited by cultural arbiters who traveled in the same circles as the people they covered as digital media rose Condé Nast was slow to adapt very much true do you remember during the whole street style era how slow they adapt to that one and also during just the influencer stage they were kind of you know they poo-pooed influencers for such a long time so part of me is sort of happy they're struggling but also you know it's a fashion institution without vogue you know fashion will be in a worse a worse place without vogue you know we just it needs a reform but it doesn't need we don't need it to die um so to adapt by just tire magazines including gourmet mademoiselle and details folded of course yeah Amazon was a good one actually it continues it says by the time Mr. Lynch a former head of music streaming service Pandora this is where it comes this is where you see the white privilege right Mr. Lynch is the chief operate, chief operating executive of Condé Nast and look at his experience Mr. Lynch a former head of music streaming service Pandora right which is you know terrible right succeeded Robert A. Salberger as chief executive last year Condé Nast was in a triage mode after his arrival he it unloaded three publications uh, Brides, Golf Digest and W on Monday so that's where he's got experience from from being a you know a former head of music streaming at Pandora is now the head of Condé Nast he's like that 
Anyway, he says, on Monday, Conor Nast reckoned with how the company deals with issues related to race. Adam Rappaport, a long-time top editor, Bon Appetit, resigned after a photo surfaced on social media showing him in a costume that stereotypically depicted Puerto Rican dress. Um, he apologised to staff members in the video conference. After the report left the call, the staff voiced complaints about the Bonaparte workplace. Some minority employees said they had been used as ethnic props in Bonaparte videos, a growing segment of Condé Nast business. Trust me, I've been there. I've been accosted and taken to meetings purport, you know, under the guise that I was going to have really big input in the meeting, but they were, they were just using me as a racial prop, right? Um, I'm very opinionated, as you know, listen to the podcast. Um I'd love to hear myself speak as you listen, as you are um, witness to um, hear me speak on this podcast. So you can only imagine, you know, what taking me to an interview full of, you know, uh, venture capitalists is going to end up like, right? I'm going to go in there and try and wow the room. And it's only after you finish the, after the fact, when you leave, you're like, hold on, number one, I didn't get compensated for it. You know, if they, um, if they manage to secure a $10 million deal, I don't get any sort of, you know, fee for my performance, let's say. And then secondly, the only reason why I was there is because I was black. Yeah, it was I wasn't necessarily there for my intellect. The intellect happened to be a bit of a bonus, but the main reason is because I happened to represent um, some sort of reflection of diversity. Uh, and it continues. Um, it says, he, uh, it's so hard to be a person of color at this company, said Ryan Walter Walker Hartshaw. Sorry, Ryan Walker Hart Sean, a black woman who worked at assistant as admin at Rappaport. She said, My blood is still boiling. There's been a lot of that this week, isn't it? People with blood boiling, people being frustrated, people being tired. Um she recalled a twenty eighteen meeting of editors to discuss how to make the magazine's Instagram account more diverse. Imagine this is just the Instagram account. Look how they handle this one. In a room of about eight editors, three people were colour. She said, and we're all very junior, no power, Miss Walker Hudson said in a Hart Sean said sorry in an interview. I was like, You're asking us how to make our Instagram black without hiring more black people, which is, you know, one of the main problems. And you I see that a lot with companies I've worked for in startup meetings where um the executive branch have or the exec the people that are a bit, you know, higher up in the chain, they have they do that thing where they know anything where they ask for your opinion in a room full of, you know, subordinates. They don't necessarily listen to their opinion. And then when you re when you when you kind of raise any kind of reservation, the common thing they say is, Oh, stop being so negative, right? When you kinda of shoot down an idea they say that's not good. And then they say, Oh, what's your idea? It's like, No, you not you didn't bring me in here to for me to voice my opinions you brought me in here to uh, affirm yours so uh, forgive me for not being in idea mode at the moment but then when you do give them an idea they just completely dismiss it anyway so it means become really useless and i think i learned the hard way because i remember i used to be the person that would always give my opinion and put my hand up and fight during meetings then i realized that this is pointless i'm just causing division within the team i'm making it seem as if i don't like being here i'm making these people not like me Right, because because they're not gonna listen to what I have to say because they've made their mind up already, you know, for better or for worse. So you're better off just shutting up and letting them do as they please. It continues, and of course, if you don't like it, the best thing to do is just go and set up your own company. In it, there's nothing you can do to push people in the direction when they don't want to go in. Um, it continues it says here at a company forum on Tuesday, Mr. Lynch said Bon Appetit employees should have raised their concerns earlier, and I bet you they did, but they weren't listened to. So that's a completely ridiculous suggestion to make. A comment that rubbed many the wrong way, of course it would. In a closed uh, door session later that day, he apologized to a group of staff members who had pushed for Bon Appetit's outsider. Because these things are never just. That's the thing that I think the higher ups don't notice, especially maybe because they're not in the office day to day, but when you have a toxic environment it's really not something that comes out of the blue it's something that sort of festers over a long period of time right and through fear of repercussions or whatever it may be you don't say anything that creates a toxic environment because that means there's three or four people that go away in secret and gossip about certain individuals it just creates loads of friction so when it kind of comes to a head don't think that this is the first time it's being raised because for sure there's people in the team who are less worried about pub less worried about you know um, reprisals who would be willing to go up to someone in HR or to speak to somebody else another team in confidence that and if there's one thing you know about working in an office you know 
rumors and gossip travel quickly right people love a bit of chinese whispers at the coffee machine so things will get out there people will tell people things about what's going on in um in the team so it's 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 never really an isolated incident it's always a culmination a compounding effect of instances that kind of blow up and then suddenly the you know the people hurry up and like oh my god i didn't know this was happening you should have told me earlier it's like bitch we told you earlier you just weren't listening um Continues, says, um, I want you to know I take this personally and I take personal responsibility for it, he said, according to audio recording. Um, the one time banker at Morgan Stanley, right? This is his experience, and he's the head, one of the heads at Condé Ness. A one time banker at Morgan Stanley, Mr. Lynn spent much of his career at Dish, a satellite TV service. As a hobby, he played lead guitar in a classic rock band, The Merger. He moved to San Francisco and not New York and updated his wardrobe to join Condé Ness. So imagine being somebody that's been working in streaming services and just a general you know an executive and you know mediocre executive for that regard that's the height of white privilege right being able to step you step in to con their nest and call the shots to any meaningful regard is really really ridiculous it mr lynch said has emphasized diversity efforts and environmental programs and emails to staff he said in an interview on friday that he had developed an overall company strategy as he assembled executive team in december he hired uh how do you pronounce her name deirdre deirdre findley as chief executive market officer making her the company's highest ranking black executive okay well done that one i'll give you a credit there his former executive assistant cassie jones who is black quit shortly after he gave her the gift she considered insulting free people with knowledge of the matter said <laughs> this story is mad right in november after she had spent four months working for him mr lynch called miss jones into his office and handed her the elements of style a guide to standard english usage by william struck and eb white mr mr lynch said he thought he she should she could benefit from it like how patronizing now it could be said it could just be an innocent gift right but to give somebody a book that's what is an elocution right or book or some regard um to somebody of color uh in an industry like fashion you, you can't help but the the recipient cassie jones she's been a right to read into that right because everything in fashion you have to read into right nothing is just done for show everything is done as a nod to something so for him to give her this book is incredibly tone deaf number one if it's just a mistake and also it's so rude but it's not it's no surprise really right this guy is not even from the fashion world he's been in it for what five years or so and he's already acclimatized to the bitchy catchy catty nature of the industry coming from satellite world right coming from working in a you know highbrow office somewhere he suddenly slipped into that mode of being a catty piece of shit mad isn't it he says, um, with suggestion that her own language skills were lacking, the gift struck Miss Jones as a microaggression that people said. A few days later, she quit. Before leaving the headquarters at One World Trade Tower in Lower Manhattan, she placed the book on his desk. <laughs> I thought that's a really good microaggression back actually to be fair microaggressions are fucking stupid but if you're gonna do it that's really good that's super passive aggressive Mr. Lynn said that he hadn't meant to insult Miss Jones who declined to comment on this article he says I really only had one intention like every time I've given it before for it to be a helpful resource as it's been for me I still use it today I'm really sorry if it's interpreted that way but that's stupid because imagine if his book of choice to give people was um, seven ways to grow rich or something right and he happened to give it and he happened to give it to his assistant who everyone knows is paid pittance right that would be also uh it's a good book to give somebody but that's also a book that's you know that'd also be incredibly rude you'd also have to take that the wrong way right this guy is essentially you know thumbing his nose in my face by giving me a gift that purports to be seven steps to get rich and he's paying me i don't know five pound an hour that wouldn't be on either so again the lack of uh, <laughs> the lack of emotional intelligence is really low in it in these kind of places i had no idea there was an issue i didn't know i didn't know i didn't know like bloody hell these guys aren't gonna survive i don't think um before lynch's arrival david remenick the editor-in-chief of the new york objected to a plan that would lower the magazine description price and raise the rates he was brought aboard he was brought aboard a diverse crew journalist including gia tolentino hugh sue vinson cunningham while adding digital descriptions Three people with knowledge of the company said the New Yorker was likely to pass Vogue as Condé Nast's biggest contributor to U.S. profits. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. People added that about 80% of the New Yorker's revenue came from readers, which helped the magazine weather the advertising downturn. But this is one that I want to see here. Then. 
da, 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 da. on June 4th, Mr. Winter sent a project note to Vogue staff saying, I want to say, especially to the black members of the team, how, of them, about five. I can't even imagine what these days have been like, Ms. Winter said. I want to say plainly that I know Vogue has not found enough ways to elevate and give space to black editors and writers and photographers, designers and other creators. As a lot of people you've missed out on, we have made mistakes too. Publishing images of stories that have been hurtful or in intolerant. I take full responsibility for mistakes. The British-born Miss Winter has been credited internationally as championing Relika Jones, one of the few top editors of Colour to Combat History. Miss Jones, a former editor-director of the book, department at the times who took over Vanity Fair from Grader Carter in 2017 changed magazine identity this is the bit that really is gonna I think this woman won't survive let's continue here um not um Rashida Jones but the other one let's see so the first cover subject she chose for the April 2018 issue was the actress and producer Elena Waif a black woman photographed photographed by Anna Leibovitz in a plain white t-shirt uh later covers covered Michelle Michael B Jordan Janelle Monae and Limano Miranda Miss Jones has put out 16 vanity covers featuring black people of color sorry when Miss Jones arrived she was pillared by fashion insiders who questioned her style sense imagine Imagine these fucking run of the mill, um, floral wearing, uh, ditzy white women from Labrador Grove questioning the personal style of somebody like Rashida Jones. Like, imagine, right? <sighs> Um, her choice of legwear tights with illustrated foxes drew stares, according to a report in Women's Daily. Miss Winter later showed her support for Miss Jones at the welcome party by handing out gifts, tights with foxes on them. Nice little uh, nod there, right? There she is, Radica Jones, doing her thing, looking nice and pretty. Um, at a quarterly meeting of the company executives in 2019, on Mr. Lynch's second day at Condé Nast, Miss Jones presented her plan for Vanity Fair's issues, a prime landing spot for fashion and luxury advertisers from September to December last year, right? Two executives criticized Miss Jones' plan. This, these, this woman won't survive. According to three people who were at the meeting, in particular, Suzanne Plague, Plague, Plagueman, Suzanne Plagueman, the chief business executive officer of Condé Nast Style Division, challenged Miss Jones at length, saying the plan would be difficult to sell to advertisers. To diffuse this attention, Miss Winter banged her fist on the table and said, we need to move on, according to three people uh, who were at the meeting. It, it reminds me of the meetings I used to have at startups where they had like a flat hierarchy, which is good because everyone gets a voice, but it's bad because no decisions are getting made, right? And you go around in circles. So that's a really funny note to hear. Miss Plagueman, who is white, joined the company in 2010 as Vogue's chief business officer and worked closely with Mr. Pintor. In 2018, she elevated her current job. Um, three people with knowledge of the matter said she was a vocal about her negative view of Vanity Fair under its new editor. I wonder why, hmm? Um, she had criticised Miss Jones' choices of cover subjects, telling others at the company that the magazine would feature more people that look like us. <sighs> Imagine being working in a magazine and being afraid or being annoyed that somebody is featuring people in magazines that don't look like you for a change. You've been in magazines since magazines were in, fucking invented and now you're getting annoyed. <sighs> Um, a third person said that he had heard her use the words expressing a similar sentiment. All the people said that they interpreted the phrase and similar remarks as referring to well-off white people, white women, sorry, who adopt an aesthetic common among the fashion set, you know, those people that have like, you know, cottages and houses in the Hamptons and all that sort of naff stuff. Now, through a continent spokesman, Miss Plagueman denied making those statements and denied expressing a dim view of Miss Jones' vanity fair. In an interview on Friday, Miss Lynch addressed Miss Jones' stewardship of the magazine more broadly. He said the challenge with her taking a new direction would be alienating some of the traditional vanity fair audience, um, including Miss Plagueman, I assume. I really applaud what she has done. But yeah, man. Um, I'll check out the whole thing. I want to read a bit of the uh, Bonavitti stuff in a later episode, but a really, really, really <laughs> infusing article from the New uh, from the New York Times about what's going on at Condé Nast and the rather reckoning happening at the moment. And you know, for sure, we're gonna see changes afoot at Condé Nast for sure. Um, no one's gonna survive this, as we've seen. Reparations and job market has been fraught throughout the entire process. Um, of the, you know for as a reaction to the protest in america through the death of george floyd again it's disconcerting that this is what brought about the change but maybe it's for the good going forward but yeah very funny place to be um for sure for sure for sure anna winter won't be fired she'll probably have 
she probably has to leave on her own regard or she won't even she'll probably be hanging on there for dear life right once you're part of vogue for that long what i don't know what else will she do you know it's part of her identity she probably doesn't know what else to do outside of that job um so that'll be hard to kind of reconcile what she does in the next stage but this isn't going to end well in it for all those people involved so if you feel sorry for them do oh, but i don't think a lot of people do but hey what can you do <laughs> it's funny man imagine living in a world in 2020 where you would expect to see anna winter being pressured to leave her job man i would never have thought this would happen never in my wildest dreams man crazy